Welcome back. We're talking about sprite control animation, and I'm gonna show you how to do like a run button where you hold the button and you can go faster and swap between running and walking. And we'll include that with our animation stuff. Speaking of which, go in the description and there is a link to a public post on my Patreon where you can download some sprites I'm gonna give you of the uh, legally distinct character you've been seeing throughout the series so far. Maria will give you an idle animation, a jumping, a walking, a running, and a crouching. They're all sprite cheats, so I'll show you how to actually get them in the game maker. So just download the folder and put it somewhere safe. I mean, once it's in your project, it's in your project, so it doesn't really matter. So, okay, go download that and let's get started. Yeah, so let's just do some basic sprite control because that's fun. So I'm going to the very, very bottom here and, oh shoot, sprite control, animation control, whatever you want to call it. Um, oh, I guess first we need to add some sprites. Check the description. You can download them, the little strip images of the, uh, of the sprites that we're going to be using. This is also important. This isn't just about animations. This is also about collision masks because eventually we're going to add a crouching feature to this character because as far as I can imagine in basically every platformer ever, there's some kind of crouching feature, whether it's actually functional, like usable or, you know, just a, a flourish, I guess. But um, it's very common, especially like Metroidvania's Mario style games, uh, action platformers. So we're going to add that. We're going to add that way later on, but we're going to be ready for it is what I'm saying. So yeah, it's uh, probably just like a Google Drive link or something. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's like a public post on my Patreon. I don't know. I haven't gotten there yet, but uh, I have actually exported the uh, the little images here. So it'll be like a folder here. It'll be a, this is Maria, right? Right? Our good friend Maria. Definitely not someone else. Uh, and for now, you know, in this video, I'll probably just give you one of my, the, uh, probably the, the running and the, the walking. Oh, that's one thing I didn't cover is a, a run button. I'll show you that after the sprites if you want. It's very unimportant for this, considering a lot of platformers don't actually use run buttons. But uh, I'll show you. I'll show you afterwards, just for fun, huh? What do you say? Uh, where is all of my stuff? Okay, so to add sprites, here's what I'm gonna do. Right-click over here. I'm just gonna create a sprite like this. Uh, I'm not gonna go to import. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna open up the actual sprite. I'm gonna go to image, and then down to import strip image. Then you just find that folder or wherever it is that you saved these images. It doesn't matter. I just had it on my desktop like I showed you. And so first let's do the idle sprite. So we're doing the big player. So I'm gonna click on it, hit open, and then you'll get this nice little screen here where you can tell Game Maker how you want to import it. So uh, there's three images here. So we're gonna do three frames and they're all vertic horizontally, uh, horizontally oriented. So three frames per row. Now that's interesting. Three frames per row. I guess you can drag this around. I didn't know that. That's weird. Okay. Anyways, don't drag that around. Uh, and then you just, you know, you can just do this until you get the, the separation right. There we go. That's all three. So just adjust the width and height, convert, hit yes. And there you go. You got a player. Uh, and it's not going to be at the right speed. What speeds did I use for these? Okay. So I did six frames per second for the idle sprite. There we go. Pretty good. And I'm going to name this S player idle. That's what I'm going to name this. So this is the idle animation, clearly. And let's do the same exact thing for everything else. So add sprite, open it up, image, strip image. I'm going to do the walking sprite next. Four frames, four per row. So do that and that and convert that. Yes, new sprite. Excellent. S player walk. Now you add the jump in the run sprites. Do it yourself. Okay, so we got an idle, uh, a walk, which the walk, I didn't set the image speeds. The walk I had at 12 frames a second, looks all right. The run I landed on 15 frames per second, looks all right. And the jump is just single image, it doesn't matter. It can be zero, it can be 30, it can be 10 million. Wouldn't recommend 10 million. So when doing our sprites, we're gonna wanna follow a, a kind of principle here. So remember with this player sprite, we put the origin down at the bottom of where we would say the middle of the player's feet are. So let's go to our idle sprite and do the same thing. For reference, we can just go up here, go to bottom center. Now you're gonna have to eyeball this a little bit and be a little bit calculating whenever you make your sprites or import them and stuff like that, because uh, this isn't actually the bottom center of the player. I would say this is, right? That looks more like the actual center pixel of the player. So you just kind of want it to match appropriately in that way. And you need to do the same thing for all of your sprites. So the walking sprite, again, we can use bottom center to kind of get a reference. To me, that looks pretty good. You might want to experiment with this stuff a little bit when you actually run your game and you're swapping between the sprites. I think that looks good for this one. Uh, oh, and you've also seen that I've cropped all of the excess space from these sprites uh, because they don't need any more space. So that's another thing is if you have extra space or maybe part of the animation kind of offsets it a lot, you may have to, you know, scoot this a lot. So bottom center, that one to me doesn't really feel right unless she's kind of leaning forward a bit, but I feel like maybe one more, one more forward, maybe not. I'm going to check my reference project really quick. 
Yeah, that's where I have it on my reference project is, is one more over. So again, just kind of eyeballing it. You'd be surprised how much that one pixel can kind of make things look a little strange sometimes. But uh, finally, do the same to the jumping animation or singular sprite. It's really what it is. And I think that looks pretty good. So our origins need to logically make sense. They need to logically be in the same place or where, you know, the player, the player's standing point or wherever you want to call it would be. Uh, they all need to match. And then one more thing is we need to add a collision mask to our player. Now, each individual sprite has its own collision mask. And by default, they normally encompass the entire sprite like this. However, that would feel kind of weird in the game. Most games have the, the bounding box or the mask, whatever you want to call it, uh, be a little bit smaller than the player, which makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. And looking at my reference project, I kind of settled on, I think this being the shape. So it's kind of hard to tell because she has a black outline, but let me pull this down one, or let me, let me pull it down a bit. So, First of all, we want the bottom of our mounting box to be at the bottom of our character's feet, right? That makes a lot of sense. We don't want the player to be hovering over the ground if this is technically the actual bottom of their collision box. But uh, I'm pulling it down to show you this. When we flip a sprite left and right, or uh, more than anything, if we flip our X scale of an object left and right, the sprite will also flip with it, which means you can see here where this pixel kind of divides the box. Uh, this box is even on both sides. It has the same amount of pixels on each side. And because the box flips, it could mean, for example, if say your box was over here in front for some reason, if you flipped the image X scale of your object, the box would then also flip with the character's image and it would be all the way over here, which means that say there was a wall object right here. You know, the player's not colliding with it. That's all cool. But if you flip the X scale, suddenly now you're fully colliding with a wall object. So something I don't like to do is whenever I'm making the player face left or right in gameplay, I don't actually like to flip their collision mask because I don't want to get any weird oddities because it just has to be one pixel off to cause something strange. So I visually like to flip the player's sprite, but uh, their X and Y scale, I don't like to flip or alter very much. So that being said, it's good to design your sprites in a way where the collision mask sits centered with uh, your origin point like this. You see, there's just as much space on this side, it's on that side. So even though I'm not actually flipping the X scale or anything like that, technically if I was flipping the X scale, this probably would be fine because it is equal on both sides. But because that can always cause really weird things, especially with collisions being sometimes a little bit touchy and a little bit strange and stuff like that, I don't like to actually change what's happening with the bounding box. But if I were to visually flip the player and keep the bounding box exactly where it is, it would function the same way in both directions. You see what I mean? If the player was flipped right now, pixel wise, like visually, but the box stayed in the exact same place, it would still completely line up. So anyways, this is kind of what I decided on. The player is not quite two blocks tall, so the player should be able to uh, walk you know, under a block like this. So now, now that we've set this all up, and again, I also added a little bit of padding up here anyways, so if we were to go into our player, change the sprite to be our sprite player idle, See, our player can clear this, but they would not be able to clear a single block, right? So again, pretty standard stuff when it comes to designing a character, thinking about their body shape as grid space. If I unlock the player from the grid, how do I do that? There we go. You can see she pretty nicely fits into two blocks like this. You don't have to be so precise, not at all, but it can just help, especially if you're doing like a platformer type thing. But anyways, so got our player size good. All the sprites will match this collision mask pretty well. But like I said earlier, every single sprite actually has its own collision mask. Um, like see this one and we haven't set that one and that one all that stuff So this one will work pretty good for all of them, right? Because she kind of retains her shape for the most part So we can basically just use our idle sprite to set our collision mask We don't have to worry about any other sprites or anything like that And eventually whenever we make a crouching sprite We can add one more collision mask and I'll show you how to swap between those in a smart way and in a functional way But again, that'll be way later So now we're ready to actually change the sprites and make sure our collision mask is correct So first let's go into our create and I'm going to add sprites. Uh, actually, no, I'm not going to add it down here. I'm going to add it towards the top. That is something that I like to see very quickly. So I'm going to add an idle sprite and that's going to be my sprite player idle. I'm going to add a walk sprite, sprite player walk, a run sprite, which again, I'll show you how to do that at the end of this video. Sprite player run and a jump sprite and that will be sprite player jump. There we go. And like I mentioned, our player needs to be able to face left and right, so we can add one more variable. Um, do I want to add this under moving or sprites? I think moving, because we're going to be using it for other things later. So uh, we can call this variable face. I'm going to default this to being one. It's going to be like move dir, where move direction, if it's one, we are moving to the right. If it's negative one, we're moving to the left. If it's zero, we're not moving, except we're just going to use one and negative one for face. So either facing the right or the left. And it's really nice because it's so similar to move dir, we can actually just kind of use this variable to get this one. So before we 
swap any of the sprites, let me just show you how the face thing needs to, needs to work. So let's go back to our step. And like I said, because face is gonna be used for other things and it's very closely tied to our move direction, uh, I'm gonna go back up to our X movement code where we get our move direction. And I'm gonna go right under it and say, get my face and just giving this room so we can look at it. We can say if our move direction is not equal to zero, then we can say our face should equal our move direction. Very easy. So if we're pressing to the right, our face will be one. And if we're pressing to the left, it will be negative one. And here's how we can visually show that. We can open up our draw event. By default, Game Maker draws our player in its X and Y position, the correct sub image, the correct sprite, the correct scale, all that stuff. Uh, but we're just gonna add one thing to it. So we're gonna say draw sprite extended. That's what this function is. First input is what sprite do we wanna draw? And that's just the sprite we already have. So our sprite index, same with our sub image. Uh, it's just our, our image index. We wanna draw it at our X and our Y values. We want to draw it at our image X scale, which if we go in here, you can see this right here. So X scale, if I add to it, you see it just scales up the X, right? So it's got a default built-in value. It's defaults one and one for each object. Uh, but you can see if I did like negative one, the player would face to the left, right? But like I said, the X scale also alters the collision box. So if I scaled up the player like this, uh, the collision masks still would fit exactly where you would think it would. It would scale up as well too. But if while we were drawing our player, oopsie daisy, while we were drawing our player, if I multiplied that image X scale times our face, which is either a one or a negative one, it'll look like our player is flipping back and forth, but it's just a visual change. It doesn't actually change the scale of our object. It just looks like it does. So we can draw the same image Y scale that we have the rotation is our image angle our image blend so the color that's blended with it uh is just going to be our built-in image blend which is just white which means the color isn't altered at all and our image alpha is going to be our alpha you can see all these green things are built in and basically what game maker does by default is it does this this exact whole function just doesn't do this part because these are all built-in variables that our objects keep track of by themselves that we don't have to actually define for it we're just altering the x scale so it flips so draw myself so if I run the game now, you'll see our player looks and moves left and right and is animating like that. So pretty gosh darn good if you ask me. So cool. That's how we control that. And now we can actually just tell the player what sprites we want them to be using in our sprite control down there. So this is actually going to be very easy. So let's go with walking first. We're going to say if the absolute value of X speed is greater than zero. So uh, the absolute value of a number basically just means how far away is this number from zero. So it's just the positive version of this number. So if my X speed is two or if it's negative two, the absolute value of my X speed is positive two. So this basically just means are we moving right now because if this is greater than zero that means we're moving so if we're moving i'm just going to say my sprite index equals my walk sprite then i can add not moving so if my x speed is equal to zero then we can set our sprite index to be our idle sprite and then we can say in the air if we're not on the ground then we should be doing the jumping sprite right and uh that's our image control but every time we swap our sprite we're also swapping to the collision mask of that matching sprite, right? Remember our walking sprite and our jumping sprite and our running sprite were all pretty messed up. The only one that we actually fine tuned was our idle sprite. So lastly, we can say set the collision mask by saying our mask index should equal our idle sprite. Um, and if you wanted to be a little bit fancy, you could also do this. You could add like another thing and call, you know, say, what's our mask sprite and say that uh, S player idle. In case you want these to be different, sometimes I'll make a totally different sprite to kind of get the, uh, the mask right. Or, you know, I don't know, maybe your idle sprite changes because you have different I don't know, costumes or something? Who knows? I don't know. So you can add mask sprite as a separate thing. Just remember to make it your idle one. And then, you know, you could add that here. I'll probably just keep it that way because I think that's a little bit nicer now that I think about it. But uh, yeah, so this, this should uh, really do it for us. So let's run the game and see what's going on. Oh, look at that. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that's looking like a video game. Check your ring cam in five minutes and Shigeru Miyamoto's gonna be there with a bat behind his back. He's gonna be smiling. He's gonna be like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill you. <laughs> nice try, Mr. Moto. Or actually, maybe he's gonna Nintendo hire you. He's gonna Nintendo hire this man you. Is it worth the risk opening the door if Shigeru Miyamoto is there with a bat behind his back? I don't know. That's up to you. I don't think I can advise you on that morally or legally. 
Oh, and it looks like my player's floating, but obviously that's just the outline. I'm gonna go into my room, go into the background here, click this color and make it something that doesn't suck. Wow, these are, oh, that's okay, like a purple, let's see. Yeah, okay, so now you can see. And you will also see that we did the precise collisions, but there's like a tiny little bit where like the player can dip into the ground, stuff like that because of the way we did the sub pixel stuff. Trust me, it's fine. We deal with it later on, okay? This is a, uh, this is okay. It's not a big deal. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna use a controller instead. That's better. Oh, Oh yeah, baby. Oh, and uh, we never checked the terminal velocity thing, but you can see a player falls very gracefully down at a nice speed. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, look at that. So like I said, just to uh, finish this off, one last thing I'm gonna show you is how to do running. This is unbelievably easy. So let's go to this, this, this event here. Okay, moving. We have a movement speed. Much like this, we can just change it to an array and add a variable to check between it. So uh, let's add another move speed and we'll say the running speed needs to be 3.5. Uh, and again, let's change this to an array. So our first entry, so for walking will be our move speed zero, for running will be our move speed one. And then we can add sort of uh, an, an input. So I'm gonna say this variable will be called run type and we'll set it equal to zero. So first things first, we have now changed move speed the variable to be an array. So let's go into our step event and clean that up where we actually use it, which should be at the top of our X movement. Uh, yep, there we go. So getting our X speed is move direction times our move speed. Now this is an array and the move speed we want to be accessing is whatever run type we are using. So this will give us the same results since our run type is set to zero right now. So it'll look exactly the same in our game. So a very easy way to set this is to bind it to a button. Remember, we do things like our uh, our right key, as long as we're holding D or right on the D-pad is returning a one and otherwise it's returning a zero, right? And that fits perfectly for our array here. There's a zero and a one. So zero for not pressing a button and one for pressing one. So we could just add another button. Let's do that really quick. Let's open our get controls. I'm gonna middle click on that. We're in our get controls function and I'm gonna add a new one under action input and uh, I'm gonna call this run key. Hmm. You know the drill. It looks like this. We're checking for a continuous input, so we're using keyboard check, not keyboard check pressed. Same with gamepad button check, and we're gonna clamp it. We do need to clamp this one. Remember I said we maybe don't need to clamp these. We do need to clamp this one because uh, if it goes, if it's either not zero or one, then it will crash our game because we're just checking an array that only has two values. So, and we're using the same naming conventions. We're not gonna call this pressed because it's a, it's a held down button. So I chose H for my keyboard thing. Feel free to make fun of me for coming up with a really stupid controller scheme because I don't play on keyboards. Uh, just know that I will cry about it later. And for the gamepad, I used gamepad face three, which is the left face button. So X on Xbox and square on PlayStation. It's just kind of how a Mario games are set up. So our run key is here. And basically, what am I doing? Where am I going? Go back to the player. Here we go. Uh, and so basically right above where we get our X speed, we can just say our run type needs to be equal to our run key, right? You could just input run key right here. Um, but I like to put this in its own variable just in case, I don't know, for some reason, you know, maybe there's a whole level where like running is disabled or something like that. And you could, or where walking is disabled, one of them. And so right here, you could just force, you know, if dom level, then run type equals one at all times. You can only run in this level or something, you know, you could do something like that. And you wouldn't want to edit an input like this. So that's the main reason I would be doing that. So I'm gonna scrunch this all back up uh, and we should be good. Let's uh, let's run the game and find out. Wait a minute. Well, speed wise it works. I forgot. We uh, we didn't uh, da, da, we didn't change our sprites based on it. So it looks a little looks a little funny. This animation looks a little funny in the first place. I like the running one better. So let's go add it back in. Here we go on our way down. All right. So we have walking. So if we're moving at all, we should be walking. That's great. Uh, and then we can overwrite that again so we can say running. So we can say if the absolute value of our X speed is greater than or equal to our move speed number one, which is our running speed, right? So if we're going that fast, then we can say our sprite index equals our running sprite. So if we're moving, set it to walking, uh, but if we're moving over our 
running speed or equal to it. Then we go to the running sprite, it just overwrites this. Uh, if we're not moving, this one just overwrites this one. The order of these is pretty important. Remember, uh, they just do it in order, you know? So if I were to put running above the walking, the walking sprite would always overwrite it because, see if I did this right here, if our absolute value of our X speed is over our running speed, then it would be the running sprite. But then because our X speed is over zero, still obviously it would just set it to walking. So the order there is kind of important. And by kind of, I mean completely important. I guess this one could go before those, that doesn't really matter. But the air one is the most important because that's just what uh, our player needs to look like in the air. So anyways, let's test it now. Oh yeah, baby. Look at that. Now we don't have any momentum or anything like that. And I'm gonna cover that in the future, building off of this initial series. But for now, we have more pressing things to cover. So that's it for that one. And next we are gonna be moving on to slopes. That's right, everybody. Get ready for it. Ooh, now we're getting to the good stuff. So I'll keep it short. Buy my game if it's out. Wishlist it if it's not. Subscribe and check out the Patreon. And also give yourself a pat on the back. This is part four of a series. And I guarantee you, like from this point on, you can just, just keep looking at like the number of views on the video compared to the last one, especially compared to the first one. That's you. You're the, you're the percentage of people getting through. You're actually going the distance, Hercules style. But yeah, that's that. And of course, I have to shout out my star gamers, Nixionic. Null, Caden Brightwell, Joseph Sandlin, Midnight, AOGO, Christian Donovan, Jazzy, DT, Richard DeLuca, Arya Sparks, Maya, Robel, Crazy Poo Chucker, Harrison, Joshua, Takuni, Ruben Leoville, Moody, Mikel Alexander, David Rivas, NerdBoutique.com, Carlos Acosta, John Brown, Frog Salt, Joshua Hurry, Marco Romo, Howie, Sam Live, Andreas Premel, Bill Lotti, AOAO, Amar Ali, Nick Lee, Matthew Carr, C, Mancat, Patrick, Jaskarit Brar. See, I changed it this time to what I think is the wrong one. Dean Blackborough, Micah Smith, Matt Lumens, Joan Newman, Finn Leavell, and BB Samurai. Thank you! Now also just to clarify, uh, because of the way I work and the fact that I have to get back to work on Starcade, uh, I have scheduled all of these videos in advance and especially like this video going onwards, I've scheduled them pretty far. And the unfortunate thing about that is obviously I can't update the shout outs for, uh, for each and every episode because you can't alter a video when you've scheduled it. Once you've scheduled it, you've scheduled that video. And uh, it takes a decent amount of work to like go back and re-record an outro, retype up all of the names, then re-render the video and then watch it to make sure that doing any of that editing didn't screw anything else up. Uh, it takes a lot of time and I have to get back to development. I really have to get back. So however, the last video of this series, the ninth video, I'm not gonna schedule that one. I'm gonna edit that one like the night before that it goes up. And that's just short enough of a time to where uh, basically anyone who from the start of this series to the end of this series has joined on the Patreon, will get a shout out in the end. So I love you and I appreciate you and I extremely appreciate the support. So yeah, if you wanna join the Patreon, you wanna shout out, you're gonna get one, I promise. Okay, just figured I'd mention that here. All right, anyways. On to slopes next. <laughs> All right, see ya.